going to give a very brief overview of the uh, Sexual Harassment of Women at Workplace Prevention, Prohibition and Redressal Act of 2013 known as the Posh Act as well as the Posh Rules, um, Associated Posh Rules of the Sexual Harassment of Women at Workplace Prevention Act. Now this act addresses sexual harassment at the workplace and uh, sexual harassment at the workplace laws pertaining to sexual harassment has been uh, in force since 2013. But there is a lack of clarity on various aspects pertaining to the law. For example, what constitutes sexual harassment? What are the obligations of the employer? What are the remedies, safeguards available to the victim? And uh, what, the, what is the procedure of investigation? And more importantly, what is the criminal consequence of sexual harassment? Now, the evolution of the law on uh, sexual harassment uh, prevention actually started with Vishaka versus State of Rajasthan, which is also known as the Vishaka Judgment. The Supreme Court framed guidelines and issued directions to combat workplace sexual harassment. Now, sexual harassment uh, can in include a gamut of unwelcome sexually determined behavior. It could be either direct or by implication. So, for example, uh, physical contact and advances, uh, say demands and requests for sexual favors, sexual colored remarks, uh, showing pornography, any other unwelcome physical, verbal, even non-verbal conduct uh, of any sexual nature. Now, in case a, a woman employer has a reasonable apprehension that in uh, her employment, uh, the duration of the employment, her uh, uh, workplace environment, her salary, her promotion, all of this determines on her giving sexual favors and she feels threatened by it, that also constitutes sexual harassment. And um, in case she feels that there is a disadvantage in uh, promotion or recruitment, um, given the, uh, you know, the basic favors that are being asked or uh, requests for, of sexual nature, then these are also supposed to be sexual harassment, right? Now, what are the key provisions of the Posh Act? Now, key provisions are, it extends to the whole of India. And uh, the aggrieved woman, as understood by the Act, it can be any age and it can be employed or not. Now, that is very significant because the woman need not be an employee but can even be a customer or a client and who can be sexually harassed. So what is the, uh, the most important point of this is that this incident of sexual harassment should have taken place at the workplace. Now, the workplace is quite broad. So the workplace can be either the organized or unorganized sec sectors in India. It could be government bodies, NGOs, private organizations, which give vocational, educational, entertainment activities, hospitals, nursing institutions, stadiums, etc. What is very important about this Posh Act is it only protects women. It's not a gender neutral legislation. So what implies sexual harassment? Uh, physical contact and advances. Uh, demand or request for sexual favors, making sexually colored remarks, uh, any other unwelcome physical, verbal, non-verbal conduct of a sexual nature. Uh, it could be uh, uh, preferential treatment in employment or threat to employment uh, or, uh, you know, threat to a future employment status. It could either be implied or explicit, which is very important. It could be humiliating treatment likely to affect the uh, mental health and physical health of a particular uh, woman. And also importantly, quid pro quo sexual harassment, which is more like sexual blackmail. What are the challenges uh, in determining this? Is determining a hostile working environment. So um, that's pretty grey in area, and usually the internal committee, which is uh, set up, decides whether the harassment suffered by victim is sufficiently severe to credit a, a, a hostile working environment, and I think that is very important. And, um, you know, what constitutes sexual harassment also depends on a case-by-case -case basis. It's not something that we have a set, uh, a set of rules and say A leads to B. Uh, it is very subjective. It also depends on the particular place, uh, the events that occurred and the documentation that is provided and the uh, level to which a person has been affected by it. Now, uh, what is very important here is the setting up of internal committees. What are internal committees? Internal committees are uh, committees that are set up in each office or branch which employs 10 or more employees and to hear and redress grievances pertaining particularly to sexual harassment. So what is the constitution of the IC or the internal committee is there is a presiding officer 
usually this is a woman in a quite senior position uh, from amongst the employees themselves. The members, uh, at least uh, two members from the organization or the workforce and uh, they, they're generally preferably committed to the uh, uh, working towards social causes or women issues uh, given that they have a uh, predetermined sensitivity to these issues. Um, the external member can be from an NGO or any other association or even an individual person who again is familiar with uh, women's issues or is sensitive to these kind of issues. Um, not less than half of the IC members should be women and the term of the IC members of course is determined to be three years and uh, you know you need at least a minimum of three members of the IC to even conduct um, an inquiry. Some of the challenges I see with this is for very small organizations with few women uh, stipulating that you know the the person in charge of the IC should be a woman of senior position is quite demanding. Uh, also to have that uh, you know not less than half the IC members should be women uh, in organizations where they are uh, um, um, you know a minority this would pose a challenge. So these are things that we need to think about uh, because the the end is more important than uh, you know sticking to these it is important to try and see how we can work uh, with employees who might be less than uh, less number of women in uh, uh, in an organization, small organizations that don't have senior women positions. So those are things that we need to think about a little more. Now the procedures of working of the internal committee is uh, is the internal committee per se is quite powerful um, and it has quite a long reach. So some of the powers vested um, in the civil court under the Code of Civil Procedure 1908 is also pertinent to the IC. So for example, summoning and enforcing the attendance of any person or examining him or her under oath, uh, requiring the discovery and production of documents required for the inquiry, any other matter that might be prescribed in the course of the inquiry is also under the powers of the internal committee. Now, there is a complaint mechanism. The complaint mechanism should be adhered to and understood by most women filing complaints. The fact that the aggrieved woman who intends to file the complaint is required to submit um, all the documentations, copies of the written complaint, along with the names, addresses and contact details of the persons, uh, either the perpetrators or the witnesses, and the witnesses rather, um, in, in a matter of three months, right? From the date of the incident. If there has been a series of incidents, what can we do? Well, then three months from the date of the last incident, it has to be filed within three months. Um, and if there is a suf if there is a delay in filing, there has to be a sufficient cause submitted before the IC for the delay, and that can definitely be taken into consideration for any extensions. Um, in case uh, for physical incapacity, uh, you know, a serious nature of uh, health or even death of the victim, uh, friends, relatives, co-workers can also file on behalf of the victim. Right? Um, so now this is the general procedure to apply to the IC. Now what is the exact complaint? What would you write in a complaint? What is necessary for the complaint? See it should be addressed to the IC members, not an employer HR representative. So it, the moment the matter goes into the IC, it is addressed to the IC. Uh, it should be concise, uh, it should be written in simple language which gives the facts and is very clear on the nature of the offence as well as the details of the offence and the time frames of the offence. Uh, details of the exact incident, date, time, witnesses all have to be mentioned in your complaint. The circumstances preceding and following the incident also, whether the complainant asked the respondent to desist from unwelcome acts, was there a resistance from the uh, victim, the supposed victim, uh, and uh, you know mention of not to go ahead with this particular act uh, were there any other specific follows because of the uh, the act or the lack of uh, you know compliance with the act as many documents as possible for example um, documentation is incredibly important cannot be stressed enough emails screenshots of sms whatsapp messages call details photographs recordings uh, as much as possible of documentation that can be given to support the particular case. And uh, details of the respondent have to be given um, and also a little more information about, uh, you know, the um, interaction with the correspondent, I mean the respondent. It could also be whether there is a particular, um, you know, um, flow structure, a subordinate or it could be a, a manager 
that kind of workflow structures also should have to be mentioned right the redressal mechanism is uh, very well thought out there are very specific timelines for the redressal mechanism uh, for um, example if you having a written complaint along with all the documentation has to be filed within 3 months of the incident and then you need to upon receipt of the complaint one copy has to be given to the respondent within 7 days and then once the complete the, the respondent has actually complied with it he is uh, required to reply in, uh, with it, with the list of supporting documents his uh, supporting documents um, within 10 working days and then there are other uh, for example how the enquiry is going to be done it has to be completed uh, within a total of say 90 days from when the complaint has been filed um, so there are specific guidelines and there are very specific um, uh, a mechanism to which this uh, this entire system works um, and then uh, you know uh, the once a decision has been reached by the IC the IC can go in different ways one is the in relief now the actual relief could be uh, compensatory at the end of the judgment uh, but uh, there can be an interim relief provided to the uh, victim so that involves transfer of the agreed woman or respondent to any other workplace uh, while this uh, inquiry is going on granting leave to the agreed woman up to a period of three months in addition to her regular contractual leave entitlements um, and then restrain the respondent from uh, you know uh, overseeing any of the uh, uh, woman's uh, work or uh, you know any reports that need to be submitted the respondent is removed from that uh, position what is the punishment that can be prescribed usually the punishment uh, sort of tends to fall under the service rules of the organization each organization uh, if the organization does not have uh, the service rules then disciplinary action including say written apology warning reprimand censure withholding of promotion withholding of pay or increments uh, even terminating from the service uh, going through counseling sessions or uh, putting them through community services are also recommended depending on the nature of the crime, uh, the uh, the seriousness of the crime and uh, the effect on the uh, woman employee. Uh, deduction of compensation payable to the aggrieved woman can also be done from the wages of the respondent themselves. So the payment of compensation per se uh, is determined based on section 13 of the POSH Act and uh, the mental trauma, pain, suffering, uh, emotional distress caused to the aggrieved employee is taken into account. Uh, also the loss and carrier opportunity due to incident of sexual harassment the medical expenses that might have been occurred uh, by the victim for physical or psychiatric treatment uh, the income and status of the alleged perpetrator right uh, the feasibility of such payments in lump sum or uh, in uh, specific installments are also taken into consideration now what happens if the respondent fails to pay the uh, after sufficient warnings the IC may actually uh, you know uh, add this sum as an arrear of land revenue and send it to the district collector so it goes to uh, an external organization and a, as well as a slightly more serious way of compensating mm, now what happens if there is a frivolous complaint there the two sides always to a story and if there is a frivolous complaint filed by a woman uh, disciplinary action will be taken against it as per the uh, you know the uh, the way the organization is set up and the service rules of the organization so that disciplinary action will be taken depending on the severity of the complaint filed and uh, the level to which it has also caused trauma to the respondent who is actually being falsely accused now what is very important about the posh act is the confidentiality now the confidentiality is uh, it's very significant given that the sensitive nature of the complaint and um, you know to a large extent the mental and uh, physical well-being of the um, uh, alleged victim so the significant importance attached to ensuring that the complaint and connected information are kept completely confidential uh, this has been uh, you know will not be subject to the provisions of the right to information act 2005 and that's a very very um, important provision which provides uh, confidentiality to the victim and uh, what happens if there is no IC uh, constituted well, there are certain consequences. Uh, one is that uh, the IC, if it's not constituted, then the employer might have to pay a monetary penalty of up to, I think, INR 50,000, uh, which may be imposed immediately. 
uh, if the same offense is repeated over a period of time with no corrective uh, measures taken then uh, the uh, the fine could be doubled uh, there could be a re uh, deregistration of the entity um, cancellation of statutory business licenses so there are multiple um, you know consequences of this non compliance and uh, what we have to remember is all these offenses under posh act are non cognizable uh, they cannot that, that is there can be no arrest without a warrant right now one question that uh, most people are confused about are what are the examples of some of the conduct amounting to sexual harassment? It's a very, very, um, uh, I think, I will not say exhaustive, but a very wide list of, um, you know, offenses that can be included. So, you know, it depends on generally the specifics of the act and the circumstance, but generally speaking, any unwanted sexual advances or propositions uh, you know, pestering for dates, receiving unwelcome sexual suggestions or invitations, uh, leering, making sexual gestures, displaying sexually ob suggestive objects, pictures, um, making use of uh, derogatory comments either on the body or the dressing, um, slurs, suggestive jokes, um, you know, physical conduct such as unwanted touch, movements, uh, being forcibly kissed or hugged, um, written communication, it could also be through email, it could be WhatsApp, it could be Facebook messages, it could be through the computer network and also exposing. Uh, if someone exposes their private parts or uh, stares at a woman's uh, private parts making her uncomfortable, that is also considered as some of the examples of sexual harassment. However, there are many, many more, um, for example, even gender-based uh, insults um, you know, subtle innuendos and, um, uh, you know, general taunting of uh, imperfections, uh, physical appearances and eve teasing, whistling, uh, you know, obscene jokes, jokes causing or like, likely to cause some sort of awkwardness or embarrassment, um, you know, but explicitly or even implicitly suggesting any sexual favors um, and uh, I think very importantly denying equal opportunity in pursuit of career uh, options um, and making the environment very hostile for the person to function um, and uh, you know prevail and uh, you know the, uh, sort of implying either directly or indirectly uh, consequences to the workplace and their uh, you know their employment the future of their employment and all those will come under the gamut of um, you know conduct amounting to sexual harassment there are many many more and a lot of other acts actually come hand in glove to give a lot of credence and support um, and power to the posh act um, so those also have to be taken into account when we go forward with uh, any sort of uh, grievance and redressal from under this posh act um, it's quite a strong act and of course it is not gender neutral given the fact that it is only for women and it's not for men um, and also it is at the workplace so the workplace can be defined as multiple um, areas but again this act only determines sexual harassment at the workplace I hope this helped there is a lot more to be understood about this act but it is important to have a rough idea or at least a general idea of what this act entails and uh, you know to at least have a minimum understanding of what a woman's right is or what is not correct at a work.